Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Harpreet Singh. I'm a first year here at Harvard College and a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. The Institute of Politics is excited to be a part of this fall's Harvard Votes Challenge, a voter registration competition between Harvard schools. Harvard has partnered with TurboVote to streamline the voter registration process and provide important information about voting deadlines. HKS students can sign up by going to bit.ly slash hkvoter. All other Harvard schools can sign up by going to bit.ly slash harvardvoter. Before we begin, please note the exit doors which are located on both the park side over here and the JFK street side of the forum over here. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation online tonight by tweeting with the hashtag public interest technology, which is also listed in your program. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming our guests, Ash Carter, Vanita Gupta, Reid Hoffman, Latanya Sweeney, and tonight's moderator, David Eaves. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the forum uh, on a Friday evening. Um, uh, I appreciate especially the students who I know have, have a quorum call at the moment and uh, are carving out time to be here instead. Um, I'm unbelievably excited to be here. This is a panel I've been wanting to do for a long time. Um, as many of you have probably read in the news of late, uh, there's been increasing concern about the impact of technology on society um, and on public goods. And so much so that a number of people started to think about what should we be doing about that? And particularly, what is the responsibility that technologists have um, in the technology they create? And this has led some to uh, start to talk about the idea of a public interest technologist. So who are the people who um, are thinking about how technology is going to impact society and are advising both governments and the rest of us about how we should be managing that? Um, to think more about public interest technology, uh, we've invited four uh, unbelievably smart um, and articulate people to, uh, to come join us. And I'm going to introduce them briefly, and then I'm going to dive right back in, right in, because we only have an hour, and I want to get as much out of them as we possibly can. Um, so uh, I have Ash Carter, who many of you know. He's the director of the Belfer Center here. Uh, he, before this, ran a really small organization um, <laughs> called the Pentagon. Um, it's like kind of small, but some of you have heard of it. Um, uh, and then Vanita Gupta, who's immediately to my left here. Uh, she's the president and CEO of the Leadership Conference, but before that, um, she was the head of the Human Rights uh, Division at civil the DOJ. Rights. Sorry, Civil Rights Division at the DOJ. Um, and then Reid Hoffman, uh, uh, also uh, someone who's run some small organizations that you may have heard of. Uh, he's a partner right now at Greylock, um, but he's a co-founder of LinkedIn and kind of grew LinkedIn to what it is today. Also um, was a co-founder at uh, PayPal and helped grow that organization, one that actually most of you use every day, whether you're aware of it or not. Um, he's also recently written a book called Blitzscaling, uh, which I encourage you to go check out. And then finally, I'm unbelievably excited to have Latanya Sweeney. Um, <laughs> Latanya is a professor here at Harvard um, at the School of Government, um, and she's the director of the Data Privacy Lab, where she does incredible work um, looking at how, uh, most recently, on how uh, local governments are securing electoral rolls and onboarding people onto electoral rolls and, and questioning whether they're doing that effectively or not. Um, but before that, she was the CTO at the FTC. Um, so she's been on the inside of government, but now she's doing incredible work on the outside. Um, so with that introduction, I want to dive right into some questions. And so maybe I want to talk initially, Latanya, you've been kind of doing public interest technology for several years now. Can you tell me a little bit about like, what's your personal journey about how you came to this work and, and why you think it matters? Yeah, I would say I've been doing it for two decades. Um, my, I, all my life wanted to build a, com a thinking machine. And so I was a computer science student at MIT uh, getting my PhD, and, and I just had this real passion for computers. So you can imagine my shock one day when, as I'm walking by, an ethicist says, computers are evil. So, <laughs> so I had to stop and try to correct her thinking right there on the spot. Um, and she basically foretold, the year was 1997, uh, uh, 1996 actually, and she foretold the future, uh, that she said that there's so much data being collected that is breaking our social contract when people go to the doctor and so forth. She was particularly concerned about a health data set that came out of here in Massachusetts on state employees and their families and retirees. 
And she said, look, you know, now this data is sort of not just between a patient and a doctor, but all these other, they're putting it to all these other uses. And I said, Dad, don't worry about it. It doesn't have anyone's name or social security number. You shouldn't really worry about it. And she said, well, is it anonymous? So it had the full date of birth, uh, gender, and zip code. So if people, uh, 365 days in a year, um, people say live 100 years, and two genders, that's 73,000 combinations. But the typical five-digit zip code in the United States only has 25,000 people. That meant that that combination tended to be unique. So I said, well, let's see if it's really true. William Weld, who was the governor of Massachusetts at the time, he had collapsed, and so his information was in that data. And I went down to City Hall here in Cambridge, got the voter list, which uh, cost me 20 bucks and came on two five and a quarter inch floppies. And by the way, which my younger students don't know what I'm talking about, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> but, uh, and sure enough, six people had his date of birth, three of them were men, and he was the only one in his five-digit zip code. Those three combinations were unique for him, and they turned out to be unique for most of the people in the United States, 87% of the population. Um, and what was interesting about that th is one day I'm a graduate student, and the next day I'm testifying before Congress. Because at that moment in time, two things had happened. One, it wasn't just that data set, that was the standard around the world. And two, the United States was just, Congress was debating what to do about what became known as the HIPAA privacy rule. So th that sim those simple experiments that I had done ended up having worldwide impact. And so the work is actually cited in the preamble of HIPAA and to change laws all around the country, around the world, and many of those laws have my name on them. That was the first time that I was to be able to see how a simple experiment could have profound impact on how we live our lives. And, uh, and this, I this idea was to be replicated over and over again through my life and my career, uh, from showing unexpected discrimination in online ads and, 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 and unfairness in algorithms, to just tons of work that I was able to do at the FTC, and to many of the work that my students have done since I've been here at Harvard. Amazing, thank you. Ash, you also have a personal story that kind of got you to, to this space, you know, from the people who taught you. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got I'll here and why it matters I'll, to you? I'll, I'll be quick. I, I, I started out in theoretical physics, um, and that's what I was going to do. But the people who were the generation that taught me, the mentors of that time, were the Manhattan Project generation, or immediately thereafter. They had done something of which they were actually proud, a disruptive technology, put it mildly. <laughs> they were proud of it because it, in their view it had ended World War II and kept the peace for 50 years. But they also knew that it had a dark side. And they felt, and they instilled in me, that I, as a knowledgeable person, had responsibility. And with the knowledge and the power that comes with that, comes responsibility. And so that's why when I was asked for, to come in 38 years ago for one year, just one year, my very first Pentagon uh, job when I was in and out, uh, they told me, you have to do this. You have to do this. You're being summoned to do it. You have to do it just for one year. And I'm really glad I, I did. And then I was in and out and so forth in, in life and did business and a lot of academia and, um, and so forth, but it stuck with me. But it doesn't come out of nowhere. And one of the reasons I love being here is I hope that a little, uh, that little of that spirit that I can pass on and sticks with these fantastic people that we have here. Before I ask Reed to say something, Ash, I know you've worked with Reed. There's a few things you might want to Thank say. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I, I do. I do. I do. I want to. I want to say something because I'm very much an admirer of Reed Hoffman and in his debt, and not only because of PayPal and LinkedIn. So, but there are a few things that are really dear to my heart. Uh, the first is that LinkedIn has has been pioneering what I'll call a blue collar LinkedIn. That is not white collar professional people, which is where it started, but everybody, let's say a machinist in a town where the factory is closed, but is a very worthy citizen and appointment. And if our people don't see a path ahead for themselves and their families, we're not going to have a cohesive society. So it's a huge thing. The other thing is more close to my home is Secretary of Defense and before that, you know, many other jobs over time. Uh, 
he was one of the pioneers in veterans employment, recognizing how super, and this isn't something you do just to say thank you, it's because they're really good. But there was an odor hanging over from Vietnam that they were not, and there was something wrong with them, and that needed to be dispelled, and he helped uh, do that. And then the last thing is he served on the Defense Innovation Board, which is a group I got of him and Bezos and Jen Palka, and so and these are titans who have all kinds of stuff to do in life. And they don't have to do this. They don't have to give their time to the government. They don't have to give their time to the Department of Defense. And they did, and they didn't always tell you what you wanted to hear, but they'd tell you what you had to hear. And I learned a lot, I got a whole lot out of it, and I, I, it, it is a public service, and he does stuff like this all the time. So he is a public interest technology. I didn't want the event to go by without my saying that. Thank you. Um, so Reed, you've been at the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, you know, the, the, you were part of the PayPal Mafia, the kind of the group that brought PayPal to life, uh, and then LinkedIn. But a, a lot of the people that are kind of in Silicon Valley are they have kind of a, a relationship with government that's a little bit arm's length. They're not really sure what they think of it. There's sometimes there's a libertarian streak. And yet you've been pretty vocal about the responsibility of technologists and the kind of thinking about how to engage government. So can you tell us a little bit, like wh why did you end up in this place? Is, what's your journey to this? And, and then what can that tell us about how we should be engaging Silicon Valley? So many of the folks who end up in as Silicon Valley technologists are, you know, a little bit outlier. They, they, they discover their ability to influence the world just by building some technology, and so that has a more tendency to, uh, to align to well, it's all about you know my own hands and this technology mm -hmm. I'm building and so forth, and that then informs a, <clears throat> an ideology that uh, is incomplete. Because by the way, you know, how does the internet get? built, DARPANET, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, there's just this whole stack of things where there's this, these platforms in society of education and laws and infrastructure and, and, and so, um, you know, thinking about how a society works and that part of the mission that uh, I decided to uh, get on when I uh, started thinking about this at college at Stanford was how do we help humanity evolve at scale? And when I, I actually not reflexively a technologist. I don't think, oh, I'm, I, I just love technology. It's the change of, of how we are better selves, both as individuals and a society, and how does technology get us there? And so part of the reason why most of my career has been focused on networks, LinkedIn, PayPal, Facebook, other things, is, is, is how do we uh, try to design and build these systems that both help us navigate, but also then help us navigate uh, together as well. And that uh, is part of how I uh, tend to look at this. My, um, you know, and I did a master's degree in philosophy at Oxford, and I tend to think a lot about what is human nature. And, you know, we're, we're citizens, of, we're creatures of the polis, right? We're, we're naturally social animals. And so you have to think both individual and society together as you're doing these things. Hmm. Um, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, you've been doing civil rights work for a long time now. When you look at the tech sector, what lessons can we, the civil rights movement around for a long time, what lessons can we be drawing from the movement that you've been involved in? What, what works, what doesn't work, what lessons can we draw? So I'm neither a technologist nor a physicist, and so like I clearly am like the oddball here on the panel, but I have been a civil rights lawyer my whole uh, adult career. and. Um, I think, you know, I've, at, when I was at Justice and even before working on things like criminal justice reform and uh, police reform, voting rights enforcement, lending, trying to prevent discrimination in lending and housing and the like, and I come to this kind of intersection with technology from that vantage point, which is that increasingly kind of the, the ways in which <coughs> consumers are interacting on all of these issues is influenced very deeply by di the digital sector and the technology sector and that the laws that were so hard fought in the 60s and 70s around the Fair Housing Act and Voting Rights Act and all these things not only are getting eroded by the courts and are <laughs> gonna increasingly uh, be uh, getting eroded, but, but are actually um, kind of these weird analogs that, haven't, that, that technology companies haven't quite figured out how to, to deal with and civil rights groups haven't quite figured out how to make them apply um, in, in, uh, in, in, their, in their world. And so, you know, at the leadership conference in 2014, kind of out of recognition on this, this was before I got there, 
we launched, they was convened a table with digital rights folks and civil rights folks to come together and actually really start to think about what kind of civil rights principles need to guide um, technology and, 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 and have more kind of civil rights voices at the table so that it wasn't <laughs> this afterthought that like the technology would get developed and then it would get implemented and then there would be a kind of revelation of discriminatory impact um, for whatever reasons. It was in their AI context, uh, it was in predictive policing, in the risk assessment instruments, in, uh, in concerns around election security and, and hacking and the ways in which communities of color are often the, the kind of bearing the, the brunt of that. And so increasingly now in our work, even as we kind of work as an NGO with um, all of the onslaught of the peril that's happening right now in civil rights from, from the administration, are also working increasingly with private sector companies like Facebook and Airbnb and all these companies that are kind of coming to us um, almost now, unfortunately, in a crisis mode to try to figure out like, okay, how are we gonna address the problems? And what we wanna be able to do is be a part of the conversation with technologists at a much earlier point of, of the innovation and n recognizing that we don't bring that kind of, um, the kind of scientific or technolo technological expertise necessarily, although there are, there's a huge sector now that's growing um, that's at that intersection. But it's, it's vital that we do this. And I, you know, just using predictive policing as an example, uh, there's, so, there's so little transparency about how some of these technologies work, what the you know, and the inputs that are going in them are often deeply problematic and based on decades of systemic bias against communities of color and African American communities in particular. And so, you know, I was when at Justice and then now in this role, when police reform was such, a, was such an important part of our, and has been an important part of our work, really trying to understand, like, how do we stop rec replicating decades of bias and injustice and use technology, which is obviously a force for good, to be that force for good while kind of preventing and mitigating the harms. And I think it's, you know, there's a recognition about the need for greater diversity in Silicon Valley among like who's generating the stuff, but also about kind of putting in those, these questions at a much earlier point um, so that we can have technology work for all of our communities. So one of the things that I, I kind of wrestle with when I think about public interest technology is, like, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, well, we'll just give the technologists more ethics training and <laughs> the problem will be better. And my suspicion is, is that's not enough, but like, what, how do we even define this problem and, and how, do we think, how do we begin to think about ways of tackling it? Anybody have thoughts? I yeah, Latanya. I go, I, you know, I, um, I often, I basically say that technology is the new policymaker. I mean, we often, we don't vote for the people in Silicon Valley. Most of the time we don't even know their names. But the arbitrary decisions they make and the technology they design dictate how we live our lives. How I use this phone, my ability to use this phone, I don't really have choice. If I want to live a better life or do a better job, I have to take the technology as it is. And encoded in that technology are policy decisions that didn't come from a government, that don't necessarily respect our historical protections or our historical laws. So one of the things in today that we need most are people who can understand that, who will work with respect to technology with a view towards what's the greater good for the technology. At the end of the day, a technology company has one big responsibility. It's a fiduciary responsibility to its, stake, to its stockholders. It's, it's decision, it's not to its consumers, it's not to society, it's not even to the rules of the country, of, of any particular country. And so there's no one there other than those technologists, those few examples we have, the students who've come through this, these processes and at a few other schools, who are doing the kind of work to shore up our helpers to shore up the civil society organizations, to shore up the regulators, to shore up the journalists in order to make a difference. And that's why public interest technology, that is those technologies, technologists who will work in the public interest are important. And I would just also say that many of our students have also been critical to Silicon Valley companies themselves because no one wants to have a company spend millions of dollars in a technology and have it disrupted because of an unforeseen consequence to the way it impacts society. So having someone on the inside that also helps them navigate away from those particular challenges is helpful for the companies as well. Uh, the, uh, just to 
uh, second that, bridges is everything. It takes all kinds. You can't expect policy makers to learn science. You can't you know, particularly expect people. When I was doing theoretical physics, I was like all mm -hmm. focused on that. But you know, as they get older and so forth, and they kind of they diversify. Um, but to me, it's all about action. And I, what I say to technologists is invent. This it's another ch call to invention. And I have a favorite thing I say to people. Um, how many of you work uh, here in Boston? I do a lot of this. It's a great tech hub. I say, how many of you work on a on driverless cars? And a lot of hands go up here. And I say, or how many of you are working on the carless driver? Think about that. And, and don't think of it as a headache or a welfare program. Think of it as, as, a, as an invention. Because these are worthy people who are doing real work and good citizens and so forth, but they're not going to be able to be deployed in that way. How can you deploy it? So invent. And the people who, took, who, who, who raised me didn't just stop with a bomb. They invented arms control, non-proliferation, missile defense, civil defense reactor safety. They didn't just talk about it or be ethical about it, they invented. And that, that's, a, that's a positive challenge. Uh, to be, let's make this better. People will rise to that. And, and, and you have to cozy up to somebody who's not like you, doesn't sell as well. I mean, I think one thing, just to, to add in, because. I think it's super important to say, what are, the, what are the kind of things we're trying to build towards in society? How do we articulate those in ways that is almost thinking about like a dashboard, about like what would be the way of representing the kinds of interests that we have in society that we'd want tech companies to uh, build towards and actually have dialogue with a number of the different constituencies in order to figure that out. Now, the one thing I want to add in, because I think this is, it's not normally that I'm um, playing the the defensive industry perspective. I'm usually <laughs> we're talking to the industry, trying to get them to move. But you know, the the kind of rhetorical point of saying you're only responsible to your shareholders. <clears throat> well, you fail your shareholders if you fail your customers. So you actually have a lot of focus on what makes your customers happy, especially over time. Um, you're uh, populated by a bunch of employees who care a lot about what kind of mission they're on and which kind of companies they work for, and whether or not they're the good guys or not. And so I, I think it's important to say, it's not to say that there isn't a real role in saying, wait, there's issues that you may not have considered, diverse voices, a history of, of, of problem, of, of uh, you know, kind of oppression or other kinds of issues that you need to be factored in and they may not be there and that dialogue has to be there and that's really important. But it can be overstated about it's only shareholders and only money for the shareholders and there's a lot of other things that actually go into the kind of company decisions. I just think it's... Let me just push on that a little sure. bit, since you, you took a little yep. bit of an exception to my um, point. Yep. So the sleep number bed is, um, is a bed that has this new thing called Sleep IQ. It's basically a pattern of sensors that are across the top of the mattress, and as you move in the bed, it takes measurements. It sends those measurements through the outside of the home, through the internet, to a server somewhere. And in the morning, you can wake up and, s and get a measure of your sleep quality. The sensors are incredibly sensitive and pick up all kinds of activity and movement on the bed. There's no promise or guarantee. I don't even get a copy of the data that comes off of that bed, right? I can only go see what they allow me to see, and I have no idea of where the server is located, under what rules the server is operating under, and who else they may sell or share that data. I don't have it on me right now, but I also have an Apple Watch. An Apple Watch is also trying to help me live a better life and get better in shape. And I can even use it to also monitor how well I sleep. The difference, though, is the, infra the data from the watch only goes to my cell phone. I can choose which apps I might want to share that data with or not. I have more control. Those are two different design decisions. And, those des and Sleep IQ is not changing this design decision just because customers have no choice. If you want that feature, then you, you either buy the bed or you don't. If, and, the, and most of the technologies we have are in that exact design where you don't have, if you want a phone, you take it as it is with its pro probes and so forth. 
So it's not really the case that a technology company, you know, I'm, I'm a computer scientist by training. Get, trying to do something new is really hard. And, the, and you know, many of my students, just, just regular computer science students, have gone to Silicon Valley. They work really hard, they're good people. It's not like they're trying to do this because they're evil. It's that, that nobody, there's nothing to make them think about, the, there's no one else looking out for the bigger issue. Because just to be able to get this thing to go faster, to give me 5G instead of 3G, all of that is the focus. And it's not that the people who built Sleep IQ were trying to be evil, they were just trying to get the sensors to work. And once they got it to work, they were trying to get it to market, they're trying to make money, they're trying to sustain themselves, they're trying to have a good product. But in those design decisions, a lot just happened. And that's the space in which public interest technology, someone who's looking out for the bigger good, and to think that it's gonna happen within that, the current way the companies work could be so if they in fact embrace public interest technology. But and, it isn't the case now. I mean, and just to, to put a fine point, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying because I think those are forces that can, and there are broader forces than what we may recognize. But I also, I do think that there's just power differentials between the, some of the customers and consumers of this stuff and the folks that are in, you know, creating this stuff. And when there's no transparency around whether it's the algorithms that get used or around like how it is that Airbnb is making decisions about, you know, who is like how its customers are going to um, be able to access or discriminate against certain populations or Facebook. I mean, any number of things that are plaguing Facebook at the moment. They're just, that's where to me having power, public interest technologists is actually really, really powerful because I think so long as we are siloed into like civil rights and the technologists, the bridges is important, but that's not going to actually get us to where we need to be unless we've got kind of embedded public interest technologists that day in and day out in these companies are thinking of these issues. I think we as a civil rights community can be very helpful kind of, you know, in, po in thinking about policies and but but those might those policy decisions that are baked into how technology gets created we're not gonna be able to see that unless there's greater transparency, there's greater kind of education in the community about how this stuff works. And so that's why the intersection of kind of folks that are really in the companies and thinking about these issues day in and day out and also understand the technology and understand the like hundreds of policy decisions that get made and what the inputs are, I think is a really important development because we can't just do this through bridging. Yeah. Can I, I just try to reconcile these two, they're not different as yeah, much as they, they as, as they're We're saying. We're just trying I, to create some controversy. <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> and Reed, Reed will have the last, last word, but the, the idea that shareholder value is the only purpose of a corporation would be completely lost on corporate culture, not only of 30 years ago, but 400 years ago when it started. It's crap, and it comes from economists who do reductio ad absurdum. And it's very clear, you can trace it, and it's rubbish. You have, and Reed said it right, those three responsibilities. If you ever sworn in as a board member somewhere, you're told there are three things. Now, you're right <coughs> that, that there's that myth out there that that's all you need to do, but Reed's right that it's, in fact, not all you need to do, and the best, best don't uh, 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 do it. We all have a responsibility. I like what you said about we're all in this together. Well, and, and in particular, like, for example, you know, I've helped stand up the AI Ethics and Governance Fund between the Media Lab and the Berkman Center because yeah. you do need to have these outside voices and, con and context, and I'm a funder of Code for America trying to do public interest technology, too. So it's not a not public interest technology. It's just that it's important in, in reasoning this through if the, if the characterization is the general demonization of, okay, all corporations act in this entirely sociopathic way, the level of which the, na the nature yeah. of the interaction is totally different. And that's the reason why I was like, look, I'm taking in a little bit of an unusual role, because normally I'm arguing for, look, we should be more transparent, we need to be more in dialogue, we need to be, that, that's my normal role in these kind of conversations. In this conversation, I'm going, well, actually, in fact, look, there are a bunch of ways that the industry has, has uh, accountability over time that need to be factored into that too. That was the only mm -hmm. point I was so, adding in. So maybe so I, may, may, can I just say, so first of all, I ran a company for 10 years, so I have a lot of, ex I have an experience, obviously not as good as you, <laughs> because nobody knows my company. Um, 
<laughs> and that's, that's, all, that's all fine. I didn't say that they have a narrow, uh, singular focus on making money. I said they have fiduciary responsibility to their stockholders. A fiduciary responsibility means you want the company to work. You, so that doesn't, so if you only are transactional in the idea that it's only about money, you're, it will in fact limit where the company can go. So to the extent that it's in their interest, their fiduciary responsibility, their fiduciary interests to think in the greater good and the bigger picture, they do. But that is not far enough to, to answer the question from the, the side of what, how this is impacting societies. You know, these companies, you know, so for example, Google can decide where it's going to put its data to determine whether or not it's going to adhere to a search warrant. They can decide, oh, we'll put it here and there we will we'll answer the warrant, we'll put it somewhere else and we won't answer the warrant. That's incredibly powerful. Not the FTC, Google negotiates its contracts with countries, right? We don't have, you know, you know the European Union is banking, on the ide is, is, is banking on an idea that if they raise the bar, that the companies will provide the technology to hit that bar, and that they will therefore give us Americans better technology because it's easier to give everyone the same technology. That's the world that we're talking about. We're not talking about the smaller decisions that are within the scope of will you be a responsible, you know, do you turn, keep your power better, do you do all of these other things, which are all important, and I'm not taking away from it. I'm a LinkedIn user, I'm a PayPal user, <laughs> I live in this society, I live in digital society, but I am not confused. It is, in fact, a technocracy. It is not a democracy. So let me, let me ask this question. Uh, so Latanya, I feel like you've identified there's, there is this corporate power. And one of the things that has influenced public interest technology was this idea of the public interest lawyer. So that in, the, in the 70s and 80s, uh, Ford Foundation mm -hmm. put money into this idea that, you know, not all lawyers should end up on kind of in the corporate law, but actually there are other ways that lawyers could be exercising power that could um, help influence the public interest and bring, help, have the law influence public interest. And so I think it was kind of an effort to try to build some, some counter power or some alternative sources of power. Now, I think it's a wonderful metaphor, but I don't know how it maps against the public interest technology space. So is it that, do we need to train 100,000, a million technologists and give them ethics? Is it that we need something like the ACLU for technology? Or is it that, I got, Reed, you've talked a lot about maybe there's greater transparency, can be a way into that trust. What's the infrastructure we need to be building to think about bringing kind of transparency or, or public interest to the technologists? What's that infrastructure look like? I mean, do you have... Well, I mean, I think it's all of those things. I don't think that there's, there's one way to do it. And frankly, on the NGO side, I think more and more of our organizations are increasingly engaged in this because of how much it implicates the communities that we represent or the work that we try to do. Um, and that's kind of the, you know, the, the outside folks that are weighing in, like the ACLU, which is a member of the Leadership Conference, and other groups that are really invested in us. But it is, as I said, we also need people on the inside that are, that are thinking about these issues and actually being very mindful um, on the kind of engineering and technology side about what, what inputs are we putting in? What is it based in? What it, like, are, they, are they already biased inputs that we, you know, how are we actually detecting where bias comes in or where there may be an opening for discrimination or for um, perpetuating implicit bias or explicit bias. Um, and, and, and then there, you know, I, I also think that Silicon Valley itself has to change about who was working there and kind of diversity even, even in its midst. And that's just a, it's a serious problem. Uh, we work with these companies, the, the numbers of folks of color, um, and it's not just kind of on racial diversity, it's across a whole gamut, but it's a real problem and it's to the detriment of these companies which often see themselves as deeply progressive and yet um, have these incredible blinders until there's a real crisis that happens that has dire implications on vulnerable communities and then it's like, oh my God, we have to, or we've tripped up, it's caused, you know, tens of thousands of people to be disenfranchised or, you know, misinformation or dark web stuff on, um, that's targeting black voters or whatever, that you name the context. And so to be, I mean, to me, it's, it's all of these things that are, that are needed. Um, and I think that 
for frankly, from the outside, we have been dealing with these issues in a crisis mode um, rather than, and now I think increasingly trying to do this in a more proactive mode of engaging with these companies earlier on. But there, as I said, there's a power differential, there's a access differential. Um, I think what's interesting is some of the companies that we've been working with over the past couple of years, it's like the first time that they're reaching out and developing relationships with some of the organizations that are really pushing on the privacy issues, on, on some of the civil rights issues, because they weren't, they thought of themselves as working in more of a kind of this bubble of innovation and tech, and, and I get it, but I, but I also, my hope is that increasingly as, as some of these issues have become so high profile that companies are thinking much earlier on about how do we actually embed these conversations, not just about ethics, um, but about civil rights, about privacy and the like, kind of earlier on, even as, and not to, to stymie innovation because that's you know, incredibly important, but to actually have thinking around it um, you know, much earlier on in, in innovation. Reed, who do you, who do you wanna see? Like I always, always say, when you're negotiating with someone, the only thing worse than a really effective counterpart is an incompetent counterpart. <laughs> it's like actually really hard to negotiate with people who don't know what they want, are uninformed. Um, so wh who do you want to have as an effective counterpart to work with around issues of technology? Like, what would that look like? Well, I mean, part of the thing that, uh, whether it's the you know, US Digital Service, New America, Code for America, uh, the uh, AI uh, Ethics and Governance Fund, all of which I've supported and tried to do this, is to say, well, let's try to get folks who say, look, I'm approaching this from a, what is the good outcomes in society, and then trying to reason to what is the framework that iteratively gets us there, identifies major risks, so you can say, okay, there, we need a hard wall, and the rest of this we discover and improve as we're going. and so. You want, and it doesn't have to be that they have to be technologists, mm -hmm. but they have to be. They have to understand that this is a, a rapidly dynamic thing in the future, and actually instincts to kind of try to roll back to the past usually just don't work. Uh, and so that's what you're trying to get. And so you're trying to get, you know, fellows, and we try to, you know, get folks who had worked in industry to come and, you know, serve in government and other kinds of things as ways to to solve these problems. And that's that's at least the work that. I and a bunch of other Silicon Valley people have been contributing to and doing in order to try to get there. It's not to say that it's complete, it's, it's a journey, but it's, it's the initial steps. Yeah, Ashley. First of all, I, I, David, you ought to answer this question. Yes. You work on this all the time, which is at the end of the day, we have a government. It's not going anywhere. You can't walk down the street and shop anywhere else. So like it or not, <laughs> it is what it is. And you've given your life, you're giving your teaching here to improving the way government functions, you changed, for which I'm personally grateful, by the way, HIPAA is like a huge accomplishment, but it's written in law. So we have legislatures that could be doing better, but they don't, they're not, they're, they're flat on their tails in this thing, as the Zuckerberg hearing showed. It was not a good showing on either side. It was an embarrassment. But imagine an alternative in which, where there had come out of that, here's what we need to do. And you know, we're, we've all decided that you know, more or less we have some disagreements, but we, we're in the same sort of frame. Um, there needs to be some regulation and some uh, self-regulation, and we're gonna do both, and we're talking about which. And that would have been a huge thing, but that isn't what happened. And I, I've, you know, it kind of is, it, you have to look at the law, you have to look at Congress and so forth, and. Uh, you know, get in there and try to make them, and they don't always understand, but know where to look for expertise and how to improve. And I mean, you showed it. How many people knew what you were writing in the paper that is the footnote in all the HIPAA laws now? <clears throat> Not many, but it's in the goddamn law, excuse well, my French. Well, well, and that's pretty cool. Well, I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> Every once in a while it impresses my students. Uh, most of the time it doesn't. <laughs> uh, because I don't want to Not be old enough. well, I don't want to be responsible for HIPAA. HIPAA's got lots of problems for which they have nothing to do with that <laughs> no. footnote. Um, but uh, but this question around the role of government is absolutely part of the problem. Is that 
our, there are three parts to this issue. One is that we actually have historical protections that technology by its design ignores. That's one part of this conversation. The second part of the conversation is what you said, that th there's a temporal mismatch. You know, policy moves slowly as a function of years. Technology is moving fast as a function of months. And so if the, the policy isn't there, the ability to get the policy there, to only have it come here, is just, is never, it doesn't particularly work. Um, and then the third piece is the government itself learning to do its job through technology itself. The world is technological. So, so I'll give you a very quick example. Uh, when I first uh, came here as a faculty member, uh, I was being interviewed by a reporter, and I wanted to show him a particular paper, so I typed my name, Latanya Sweeney, into the Google search bar. And the, ad, the paper came up, but then some ads popped up, and one of them implied I had an arrest record. It said, Latanya Sweeney arrested. And I'd say to the reporter, there's the paper we're looking for. And he says, ah, forget that paper. Tell me about when you were arrested. And I said, well, I've never been arrested. And he says, then why does it say it is? <laughs> and so now I click on this ad. Uh, I pay this money to this company to show that not only do they not have an arrest information for me, they don't have an arrest record for anyone uh, with the name Latanya Sweeney. And so then he says, so how come computers are racist? <laughs> and I said, and I explained to him that computers are neutral and that technology is not biased. And so then I, and so he says, well then how come, and we started tracking names. And eventually I couldn't distill the myth in an anecdotal way. I ended up taking two months doing a full-fledged uh, study using VPNs around the country, hitting day and night, the ads, what ads popped up on everybody's name, all, Ameri all these American names and found that if your first name was given more often to black babies than white babies, you got an ad implying you had an arrest record. If your, if your name, first name was given more often to white babies, you would get a neutral ad. And that this disparity happened at an 80-20 split. And so what was interesting about that is we have a law. We have a law called the Civil Rights Act. Discrimination in general is not illegal in the United States. We here at Harvard re uh, regularly exercise it. We give student discounts. As I get older, I'm gonna look forward to my old age discounts. <laughs> you know? And so it's not that discrimination is illegal. It's that we have a law that says certain groups in certain in situations are protected. One of those groups is blacks and one of those situations is employment. Because when I apply for a job, somebody's going to type in a name in a Google search bar and wants to see what kind of things come up. Mm -hmm. if, more, if there are two candidates and one implies an arrest and the other one doesn't, it puts a group at a disadvantage. Now, this is totally in the venue of a law we have. And so this speaks strongly to the need of government to redefine its practices in the space of the technology as well. But, you know, one of the things that I think is difficult is that a lot of courts, which move even more slowly than policymakers do, um, have just not kept up with applying these laws to new technologies. And so we don't actually have a ton of jurisprudence around some of this stuff. And it's happening now because more public interest litigators are suing companies, taking them to court, and for better or for worse, kind of trying to get courts to opine on the application of you know, legacy civil rights laws to, to modern day. But one thing, it, and I think it's gonna, it's gonna happen, but it's gonna evolve much more slowly than probably what consumers need um, in order to actually be protected or have um, a way in on this stuff. But you know, we're seeing other ways that this happens and it's where, like Microsoft with facial recognition technology, mm -hmm. I mean, there's been a lot on facial recognition technology and companies have approached it very differently in the harms. You know, there's obviously really great benefits to facial recognition technology and then great harms um, from it that are, that are obvious. But, you know, I thought it was interesting that Microsoft is actually saying, yeah, this is totally an unregulated space. We're going to ask for some form of regulation, but we're going to try to shape it. And so now they're like developing their own principles. They're going to put them out for comment 
which, you know, we know a bunch of groups that are going to be weighing in to help shape it, but what's the policy? And, and then, uh, you know, they're talking about getting, trying to get bill, a bill written and to put that forward as part of the industry. Whereas like what you saw or what I saw at least when Zuckerberg testified was this like, do not regulate us, do everything you can to just get out of the oversight hearing and make sure that like the, the feds don't regulate us. And I, you know, I do think that there's a different role for companies to play to actually be proactive actors in acknowledging, you know, that some of the stuff is in totally unregulated spaces or it's going to take 10 years for the courts to actually get their hands on it. Or frankly, even for the Senate, I mean, you know, a lot of those folks that were asking Mark Zuckerberg questions didn't even know how this stuff worked. And to, to that companies have a huge role to play in actually being proactive actors and working with folks like you all in the room to help think about, you know, what is the policy? What are we trying to solve for? What are the problems that we know ex that are going to come from this? What are we trying to solve for? And how do we at least, you know, do some regulation that provides some policies while allowing for innovation always and, and, and all of that? And I, you know, I, I just think that that's going to become increasingly important given how slowly the legal structure, the legal system works. So you mentioned the people in the room. Um, I'm going to turn to them for questions in a second, but I want to, as we're pre preparing for that, the last question I have for, for you guys is, um, who gets to participate in this conversation? So like the public interest law was really about lawyers becoming kind of public interest uh, advocates. With, with the technology, it's not really as much of a controlled group, but does it need to be people who like know how to code or who are actually like, are the kind of hard skilled technologists um, or, is this open to kind of policy people? And if so, what's the skill set that you need to have in order to participate in this conversation? Well, I'll jump in and I'm sure everyone will have a, a view on that. So when I got to the FTC, it was pretty one of the best jobs I ever had in my life. It was just awesome. Uh, I strongly recommend if you have a chance to work in senior government, you do it, I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> But one of the reasons it was awesome is it was a relatively, being chief technology officer, nobody really knows what that means. And so there were not a lot of responsibilities. And, <laughs> the, and, the, and, at, and, at, and at the senior level, the whole organization is flat. And so we just did a ton of stuff. We just got a lot done. And uh, so much so uh, that uh, when, I, when I left the FTC, um, I came back to Harvard and I decided that, you know what? This isn't actually rocket science. In the examples that I gave you, the weld example and the discrimination in online ads, you know, nobody's gonna ever call that theoretical physics. <laughs> and, um, and so the question is, can we get our undergraduates to do this? So I taught a class called Data Science to Save the World. And I told the students that at the end of the class, you'll have to do a project, and if you do a good job, I'll take you down to DC and give you an audience with regulators. And I thought I would take two or three students down. I ended up taking 26 students down. And so we set it up like a poster fair and the regulators come in. And the typical regulator is usually a white guy in his 50s, uh, a lawyer. And the students were standing by their posters and they were talking about technology that that regulator regulated that had no idea that that technology even existed. And it was really electric. It went on for four hours. It was, it was originally scheduled for two, went for four hours. The students had huge impact, both in the things that the regulators were able to do, but also that they felt like they had had impact on the world. When we came back uh, to Harvard, we started a new journal the, uh, called Technology Science. And, we, and the first, now it's uh, a publication you, from, journal, uh, from scholars around the world, but those first papers are from those 26 students. And what's interesting about those is they made Facebook fix something that no one had been able to get them to do for years. You know, it leaked your GPS location as you went around, uh, as, you, as, you were, as you went around using Facebook Messenger, it was leaking your GPS location, so Iran, uh, built a plug-in that anybody could download and you could track friends and friends of friends around as they moved around and within a week they fixed that. But yet it had been talked about in the industry for almost two years and they never fixed it. Uh, Airbnb, we pointed out that the different, the students pointed out the difference in prices that uh, different hosts were being given and if you were Asian you paid, uh, you, uh, you got 
20 about 20 percent less than you did if you were a white host for the same comparable property and so forth and airbnb stepped up and changed their pricing model so we all have now benefited from that they showed price discrimination on princeton review because you had to give a zip code there were different prices given to where you lived and asian families were almost twice as likely to pay the higher price and the list goes on and on they just had huge impact in ways that, and in just such a short amount of time. So I use that as an example. If you ask me now, where did they come from? Are those lawyers, are they, uh, where did, where did they were they computer scientists, were they economics, were they statistics? Well, they, they were turned out to be all of them. We had no, we opened the class to anyone. The students came in with the disciplinary skills they had learned as undergraduates, because it was an undergraduate course, and this is the work they did. And so this has been a reminder to me that the idea that public interest technology should be limited to one discipline, one predefined discipline, is a really bad idea because they'll bring forward an economic analysis, a statistical analysis. Some of the best work we had was done by students from the history of science. Interesting. Other thoughts? Well, well I, I just say, I, when I was a, a, a young physicist, I was sure that I knew it all <laughs> and that I had scorn for, you know, how can anybody have any opinion on the Cold War and the rights and wrongs of the Cold War and nuclear weapons? And, and Star Wars, they don't know how a free electron laser or an excellent laser. And I, then I began to work on these things and I realized the, that the, the wisdom and of, of other people who had other backgrounds and how it could be so much better if we all worked together and what a twerp I was. And it, um, uh, you, you know, I got on learning, but don't think that people who've done something different from what you've done don't know anything. Uh, they do, and if they're people of goodwill and experience, mm -hmm. they know a lot, and let's get in the game with people. Let's not decide who's most important. Cool. Let's um, maybe go to some questions. Um, there's four mics up, um, two at the top and two at the bottom. So if you have a question, please step on up to the mic, and you, ma'am, look like you may have a question. I do. Um, thank you guys so much for coming in for this amazing debate. Um, this question is directed for Reed. Um, so a lot of critics of this debate would say that um, public interest technology could potentially slow down free markets and innovation. And so I'm curious in the cohorts that you're a part of in the tech space with how that debate plays out and if you've seen kind of any leaders in, in the space both balancing ethical accountability and economic accountability. Um, well, I think you do. I mean, like, for example, the Brad, Smith and the Brad Smith and the Microsoft group is saying, look, here's, let's try to make sure that we can identify what the issues are and come and talk about them and provide that information. And that's still with Microsoft going at full speed to saying, how do we build products? And I think that the general recommendation of saying, look, let's take a stance where it isn't like, oh, we're only going to talk about you regulating if you catch us doing something right. bad is stupid and bad for society, bad for customers, bad for shareholders. So I think it's, it's, it's beholden for all of us to do that. And the key thing around operating at speed doesn't mean, you know, part of like, you know, this book that I just published on Tuesday, Blitzscaling, has a chapter on responsible blitzscaling. And as part as you get larger as an organization, you invest more in these questions. And what it is, you identify there are some major risks, a huge damage to an individual, uh, a moderate damage to a set or a damage to a system or things where you, you know, should be paying attention proactively. Are you uh, uh, causing damage to vulnerable groups and you should be for you doing that? You don't have to slow that down that much to have an active clock about thinking about that about asking those questions and then cross-checking. And now we need to do some work about figuring out, because there's you know, modern machine learning where it kind of works on data sets and can we figure out are there biases implicit mm -hmm. in the data sets and what do we do? When I was thinking about that, that was part of the reason I worked with you know, Jonathan Zetrain and Joe Ito to say let's, let's get at this AI ethics and governance fund to start trying to build the, the, the kind of the knowledge and the techniques for evaluating that as a way of doing that. But I think it's, it's, it's um, you don't, like, the mistake is when people are absolutist on either side, including the, oh, any regulation slows us down, is like, just not true. Awesome. Um, you, sir. Hi. Uh, thank you for this great panel, by the way. Uh, 
I think this question is for Reed and for Latanya, and essentially going back to that premise that firms have a responsibility to their customers, you, with an or, a corporation like Facebook, where you have two billion monthly users, is there any reasonable constituency of customers that can actually coalesce around an issue, especially one, say, like the you know genocide of the Rohingya and the role that the firm played in that? Um, and if not, what does it imply about governing firms of this scale? I'll go first. Um, so you know, Facebook is a monopoly. If they weren't a monopoly, you know, if Facebook, if there were another Facebook that was built under European Union principles, they would have lost 50, 75 percent of their customers. But there's no place to go. So we have laws about monopolies. I'm just saying, we have laws about monopolies, right? Um, so it, that's all I can say. <laughs> well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just on the Facebook example, since we've been so engaged with them, you know, the you think about what happened in 2016, and then the Cambridge Analytica scandal, and um, you know, for certainly for the civil rights groups and voting rights groups uh, and election security groups, there was a lot of anger about the kind of denial and the length, that the degree to which, and the amount of time that they actually knew that this had happened, and were not preparing for what's about to happen in in 25 days. And it's not to say that we were an army that was at all kind of on par with the size of Facebook, but Facebook, to its credit, but very late, recognized, okay, we've got some responsibility here to actually, A, acknowledge what happened, and B, to take proactive action to try to prevent it from moving forward. For a long time, they were like, well, we just don't want to do anything that would curb free speech, and it was just this notion that you know, they had the same kind of First Amendment responsibility as the government does without recognizing they're private actors and there are things that they can do. But in this context, you know, so we push them. Uh, we, they're doing a civil rights audit, which is an extensive thing, and we'll see how, how much difference that makes. But we're very engaged in that process. And they've now set up a war room. It's, it's late, but with election security, folks that are like watching for this stuff, um, and, and doing it, and we're training their, their folks because it's a room. I will tell you, the New York Times had an article about this war room, uh, I think two weeks ago, and it was a room of like 12 white people and one uh, Indian person, none of whom had had any civil rights or voting rights expertise to know like all of the different ways and myriad ways that local governments disenfranchise, move poll sites, change voter information, like all the things that happen. So we're doing that training. There's, there are steps that they are taking to kind of acknowledge the, the role that they play in, um, in really you know, designing and changing the ways in which voters uh, are targeted for misinformation and the like. But it's, it's been a slow process given what happened um, you know, almost two years ago. And I just think we have, to, we have to continue to do that. I don't know when and if you know, they ever get broken up, but until then, they are an incredibly powerful force in our society, oh. and <laughs> the amount we're bringing pressure from all parts to bear, um, and the goal is that we can, we now have finally these sets of relationships to really push them on making some, some serious changes. Are we moving efficiently on this? Not nearly as much as we would like, and there's a lot of deep frustration, but, but we are at least now in dialogue on a bunch of these different these different issues. So, you know, I love Facebook in many ways. I'm no, I don't mean to, I, like I told you, I'm a computer scientist by training. And I totally respect the civil rights organizations. But you, by, your, by, what you, by your answer, let's just think about your answer for a second. You said several, at least four times, about, talked about how slow they were to move. Yeah. They're a technology company. They're supposed to be moving like no, this. that's right. That's absolutely right. right. And, absolutely. Then, and, then, and then let's look at the things that they did. So they start this political ads thing, but you can't really track the ads because they limit your ability to do so. It's not even publicly available. I have to be a, on Facebook even to view it. So they get to see which ads it is I'm investigating. Yeah. I mean, and you still can't get a macroscopic view. Yeah, I mean, the level of frustration and, is and, deep. Yes. And, and the <clears throat> issue is not, it didn't go away. It wasn't like the 2016 election happened and all of the, um, all of the propaganda and manipulation stopped. It yeah. didn't stop. 
it's been going on. So yep. exactly what the war room is looking to look for is already there. But here's the but problem. Not, I don't know anything that got stopped. They're not doing it on their own is the issue. And to the extent that we just, I mean, what, is, what are the answers then at that point? Because frankly, Congress, I mean, there's a lot that is known about what happened in 2016 and the role, book mm -hmm. that, the role that Facebook played. And the alternative can't be that we are so angry that we are just like not participating in any kind of way to deal because we are afraid of what's gonna what's already happening in the lead up in the next few weeks on on facebook in the lead up to the to the midterms and so it is a deeply i mean folks are deeply frustrated and angry about the pace about the like you know minutia of changes that have happened the alternative is to just sit back and do nothing and watch people get disenfranchised watch voters get targeted again and watch facebook basically wipe their hands of it. I, I think there's something in between, if I may yeah. say. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not do nothing or, you know, to go out in the parking lot and take our lives. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know that you're not saying that. But, well, I didn't but, say that. But no, neither of you is saying that. Um, uh, but uh, I don't think these companies are going to do it by themselves. I don't either. I, I, I just, that's just not in the cards. Nothing's telling me that. And to the very excellent question up there, my experience over many decades of managing technology projects is mission spurs innovation. If people have a meaning, yeah. they, they go faster. And just saying you're going to disrupt things is kind of not really vague yeah. or you're going to live a certain kind of lifestyle is narcissistic. People get behind a mission and you know making a better world is kind of a slogan but and that's motivating but then you see what that has come to mean in some places and it's not really that it's just messing around where you want to or where the the suits upstairs are telling you the advertising income is, and I'm not I'm deliberately exaggerating uh, <clears throat> here. So mission is important, and the mission of truly making the world better and making things really just, and um, uh, 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 making public interest technology, you know, Reed's idea real, <clears throat> that's a challenge. I mean, that's, that's to me, that's intellectually exciting. How do we I go back to the, you know, the, the carless driver? That excites me because I don't, I, don't, I don't live in a society where things are ignored. Uh, and I think that's pretty cool. And you have to ask yourself. So mission, you know, I worked in defense. And the people who work in defense, whatever you think of national defense and so forth, man, it is, that's not a game. People took it deadly seriously. And, <clears throat> had felt huge sense of responsibility and were extremely within their frame very innovative um, so I, I I think you ask an excellent question and I turn it around and I say mission motivates it's just a matter of let's get a real mission out there and one that that matters to people and then it, it let me just plus one this you know many years ago right before 9-11 um, I was among a team of people who were approached by the military because they foresaw an attack on U.S. soil and they couldn't get the FBI and others to take them seriously. And so they wanted to build a surveillance system. And the reason I was in the room is because they wanted to build a surveillance system with guarantees of privacy. We built that system. On nine, they had anthrax coming out of a plane. They didn't have plane going into buildings and anthrax coming by mail. But, but after 9-11, you know, all the privacy constraints went out the door. But that vision before 9-11 was one where privacy was quite intact. So this idea of a mission statement is certainly exactly how technology works, right? We build to a, to a, to a goal. Is there any, I want to wrap us up just because I'm cognizant of time, but does anybody have any closing statements they want to make, any closing comments? Well, I'm not going to say anything other than thank you since I said quite a bit. <laughs> um, yeah, admiration. hopefully y'all will come up with the great answers. <laughs> for all these people and gratitude for the audience. Yeah. How's that? I mean, I, I mean for me, the, uh, there's a, a lot going on in the world, but it's an exciting time. Um, we have huge challenges, and I think that right now we're trying to articulate a mission around how do we ena enable technology to serve us as a society 
and not just us as individuals or us as companies. And uh, I think that that is an exciting mission. I know it, it brings me to the table, and Latani, I know it brings you to the table, and Reed, I know it brings you to the table. Um, it brings all of us. That's that's why we're here. I think as as people as people who are here, I hope that you will grab that mission and feel like it's important to you. And the most important thing is like, like being here, just to close on this, being here, I'm not sure people always understand how much privilege there really is. Like to get these four people, like two of these people didn't have to come very far, like Ash's car, his, <laughs> his office is upstairs, but, but two of people actually had to come far and there's, they won't travel for just anything. So you get to be part of a conversation that involves these people who are at the height of their career thinking about these types of issues. And I just want you to feel the incredible responsibility that you need to take what you learn here and go do something with it. And I hope that the flag of public interest technology is one that some of you will want to pick up. But whether it's something else, like I don't really care, but go pick up a flag and find that mission. And I hope you feel motivated by that. Come talk to these people right now while before they go, get more energy out of them, but then go do something about it. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.